just to begin, if everyone could just remember to um, keep yourself on mute when you're not talking, just to avoid any interference during the webinar. Um, and to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional own owners of the land on which we are meeting. I pay my um, respects to the elders past and present and future and the original elders of the communities who may be here today, the Wurundjeri people. Well, it changes for everyone. Alrighty, so just to begin, I'm going to start by sharing some introductory videos. So I've done a video myself um, of me cooking at home. Um, not the best quality. I apologize. I live on my own, so it was awkward to film. And then we'll show you Georgina as well. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Um, Beautiful. Hey, uh, welcome to my kitchen. Um, I'm just going to show you how I quickly make a, um, a chicken stir fry. I've already browned the chicken on a really high heat. And now I'm just going to toast up the vegetables and then add the chicken back and then add some sauce in. Alright, so I got the. Um, I already got the pan up to a high heat, so it's just about smoking, which you always do on a stir fry. I like to grab a tea towel because the handle gets quite hot. Also, just to mention, um, I love having. Um, all my seasonings at hand, so I have my salt and pepper there, all my spatula, everything there. I have my food already prepped and ready to go. And the main reason I have that is um, it's on hand, it makes it really quick and efficient being in the chair, how it's hard to run around and adapt. So that's an example of how I cook. Mm. Toast my aromatics for about oh, 60 seconds in fact, 30 seconds, and eventually straight in. Alrighty, so that was just a little bit of a sneak preview. How I um. I cook myself. Um, I'm, I do stir fries quite a lot because they're nice and easy and um, I can do a big batch of them to bring to work the next day. Um, so next I'll move on to Georgina, um, filmed a video of her cooking setup. Um, so I'll we'll whack that on now. Let me know if there's any issues with the sound, everyone. Hi, my name's Georgina. When Lockie asked me to do a video of me cooking, I said to him, uh, Lockie, I actually uh, don't cook very well. He said, oh, it doesn't matter. You can um, show how I help around uh, with the cooking and also maybe show the kitchen and how it's all set up. So here we go. Welcome to my kitchen. So first up, we've got here some uh, spaces underneath the benches. These are actually lowered, so it's good uh, for me to cut uh, veggies here or over on that side where I've started to prepare. We've got some room here underneath the sink which is uh, at standard level but I can still quite easily work around that. Over here we've got uh, the space underneath the stove and also a range hood where I can still reach the buttons. Another feature is this uh, pantry which rolls out for easy access. Which reminds me, I'll just grab the salt for the salad later, and I'll just put it over here. Now I must check the oven. Uh, this is also handy. Um, this oven door comes down and rolls in. So that's pretty cool. And I'll just check these muffins. Oh, looks like somebody's eaten all the muffins. <laughs> Turn the oven off, and I normally 
come up here and let the muffins cool. So the next thing is, we'll use the microwave. I've just washed some rice and I've already put salt in there. So I just find it easier to cook rice in the microwave. I've got this board to put things on, like a stable table, so I can easily push across. The microwave's at this lower level, which is handy for me. And it's also good that we've left this bench space free. So we can easily put that through in there and close it off. So I don't need that anymore. So this is where I normally cut all my veggies. So I'm not cut cutting much today, but if I had lots and lots of veggies, I could use the table space which is really good. So I also thought I'd show you this lemon squeezer thing. Um, good for people with uh, hand uh, issues. So I can easily squeeze it off. I won't squeeze it now because I haven't made the salad yet, but um, I think that's about it. That's my kitchen. Thank you. Alrighty. One second. Uh -oh. Apologies. All right. So, we thought we'd just give you a little bit of an introductory into into that and how uh, I like to cook and how Georgina has her kitchen set up. And um, so we'll start by just introducing ourselves a little bit. So I'll start with myself. So I'm Lockie O'Brien. Um, I've been a T2 paraplegic for about 13 years now. Um, a few years after my injury, I decided to learn how to cook and fell in love with it. And um, studied to be a qualified chef. So I did that for a couple of months and really, really enjoyed that and just happened to change um, change the lines of work. And now I'm working alongside Georgina doing um, a lot of the community networks, organizing that. Um, G, did you want to go on and introduce a bit about yourself? Sure, thank you, Lockie. Um, so my name is Georgina. I'm a T7 paraplegic, um, almost 20 years now. Um, I'm quite the opposite to Lockie. I'm not a very good um, chef or cook. Um, I'm sort of at the other end of the spectrum, but I do like to assist and I'm more like the assistant chef of the household. Um, but yeah, I do love food. I do like to cook. Thanks for that, G. All right, um, Antonio, did you ever want to tell, tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, hi. So I'm Antonio. I work at the Spinal Research Institute. I've had a spinal injury for since, what, 18 and a bit years now. Um, C6, 7, quadriplegic, so impairments in my hands. I grew up cooking. I have Italian background, sort of um, always been in and around the kitchen and um, have always enjoyed it. And I it was part, actually part of my rehab when I went through Talbot. Once I realised that there was a kitchen there, um, I, I bugged the OTs until they would let me cook in it and smell the place out of garlic. Um, the nurses knew when I was cooking in rehab because uh, they would all hover and see if I had any extra. Um, but yeah, I, I still enjoy cooking. I um, you know experiment a lot in the kitchen um, and what have you. So you know, and obviously. Um, cooking is an important part of life, you know, for, for everyone. So, but yeah, I've always enjoyed and yeah, hopefully share some insights today on how I go about it. Amazing. It sounds like nothing stops you from getting the kitchen. That's awesome. Um, and yourself, Shante? Hi, I'm Shante. I'm a C5 quadriplegic. Um, I guess my Cooking love came from my father because he was a chef um, up until my injury happened and I learned to cook at a young age. Um, I love more baking and experimenting with like sweets and cookies and brownies and trying to make everything from scratch, nothing like box made because I don't know, I find it more interesting and therapeutic in a way. So, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks, Thanks for it, everyone. Everyone. Um, so now we're just going to, even though you mentioned it slightly, it's, we're just going to jump into what do you like to cook? Why do you like to cook it? Everyone's, everyone's sort of touched on that a little bit. And, um, and then also who does most of the cooking in your household? 
So me personally, um, I like to cook things that I haven't cooked before, preferably, because I really like learning and enjoying that sort of stuff. Um, I actually just went to Japan for two weeks um, about a week ago. Um, and honestly, I just fell in love with the food over there, the quality of the food. So for the next few months, I'm just going to be cooking heaps of different Japanese food, hopefully not burning the kitchen down um, and really experimenting with that. Um, and the reason I love cooking is I just, I find it quite adventurous going in the kitchen and I have a large spice cupboard, which I will share with you guys at the end. Um, and I just love experimenting with things, preferably cooking on my own because experimenting with other people's taste buds can be interesting sometimes. Um, so yeah, predominantly I do like to cook a lot of Southeast Asian food. Um, and then I live on my own, so I do all the cooking. Um, what about yourself, G? Yeah, well, I'm quite the opposite again. I'm quite lazy and I like to do things quickly. Um, but if I was to cook something yummy, it would be either a hearty lentil soup or a really nice bolognese, but I would cook it in a big, big batch so that I could freeze little containers. So to I say for a lazy rainy day. Um, but yeah, so like I said before, my husband is Italian as well. He loves to cook. And um, so he enjoys it as well. So I let him be and I do all the cleaning up. Um, and he hates cleaning up. So that really works for us. But um, yeah, I do also like to bake like Shante, but I am again one of the lazy ones that uses the boxes, but um, I could add a few things in there to spice it up like a few sultanas or chop chips to make it look like it was homemade, but um, sometimes you can't tell. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's me. Thank you. Brilliant. And uh, what about yourself, Antonio? Um, I, yeah. I can't bake. That's I like cooking, but I can't bake. I tried it once and yeah, never again. It's sort of, I don't have the, yeah, I, I might offend people here, but I don't see baking as cooking. Um, <laughs> um, I tried making cookies once and it was horrible. We'll just say that. So, um, yeah, so I guess I like cooking. Um, I don't cook Italian because I grew up eating Italian. Um, so my mother ruined Italian food for me for the rest of my life. I don't go out and eat Italian. Um, I would give advice like Lockie asks about, you know, putting garlic in carbonara and that, and I'm happy to give advice on things like that. Um, I like, cook I'm a bit like Lockie. I like cooking Asian food, fresh food. Um, you know, it's nothing that's too complicated. Um, I, I, I can be a really simple eater on a day to day sort of thing. So salad, chicken fish um but then i do the i do the extreme as well where sometimes you know, like i like french cooking and lots of cream lots of butter the stuff that sort of makes you fat um so you know i'll cook things like you know one of my favorite dishes that i like to cook is sort of like chicken with cooked in apple cider cream with apples and just let that slow cook um you know so i i like to experiment with food so i you know i know what i can and can't cook I, I can't cook indian food so i'd rather buy it um so as much as i've sort of tried to cook indian food i, I don't um and and yeah sort of and, and and it was sort of when i left rehab it was a challenge because mum always wanted to do all the cooking um where i do um you know pretty much all the cooking now um but for me yeah i sort of like experiment with food and things more than anything um but yeah and i try and replicate things i learn off youtube so if i don't know how to cook something um you know i sort of or i see something if i see gordon ramsay or Lockie on youtube i'll um go okay i'll give that a go um uh, yeah there's probably there's probably not many things i won't try and cook um but yeah, I won't cook Italian. <laughs> oh, that's rough. I uh, I definitely agree that going out and getting Italian food is just not up to not up to par. Um, it's interesting. I actually 
got the interest from my parents, but it was the opposite of you. They were terrible cooks, so I had to learn how to cook. Um, all right. And how about you, Shade? Um, I really like cooking everything. So anything in a recipe book, I see, I'm just like, oh, let's try this. But I prefer cooking for other people. Um, so I don't know how to cook for one person. It's a really bad habit of mine. Trying to cook for one is really hard. So instead of cooking for one, I end up cooking for like six people. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to cut down on that. Um, but like my family is like Mauritian based. So it was all curries and rices and stuff like that. And I've started to learn how to make them, but I'm more into like Australian style food. <laughs> um, I don't mind a good curry. Don't get me wrong. Like my grandma thinks my curry is better than my dad's, which is a really good compliment. So, um, but I also love, um, experimenting with baking you know um creating new items like um I've made a cheesecake from scratch before I've made a lemon meringue pie from scratch like just doing things from the start to the finish just to see what I come up with is you know quite fun and exhilarating and exciting in the end um I also <laughs> when I do cook a curry or a bolognese I do sit at the stove for probably about five hours people think I'm a bit crazy like that but I like the longer you leave it the better it is you just have to make sure you stir it every 10-15 minutes so I'll sit there all day and cook one dish and people are like you're not but I'm like it's worth it in the end <laughs> so yeah so to, 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 add, to add to that, to that um, um, my grandma was actually not a bad cook and um when she, when I was young, she would, um, I'd say to her, what's, what's your secret money? What do you do? That's so good with your cooking. And, um, she'd just say love, she'd say it's love, but all of us nodding here know it's time spent behind the stove. Like if you, if you slow cooking something, you sit there, you keep an eye on it or putting a lot of time and energy into it and makes a big difference. All right. So now what we might do is jump on to, um, what cooking looks like for you. So Georgia and I have sort of showed you a little bit of an example um how we cook um so me personally i'll add that i didn't say in the video is i actually like to um the way my house is set up it's just a regular house for renting it um so i don't have anything accessible um and when i worked as a chef I was the same and i had to make myself adapt to the situation so i like to put a chopping board on my lap um no stable tables i don't agree with stable tables that's up to you to try but i've dropped things when i first used them so i got rid of it um, and the main reason I always have a chopping board on my lap is I will have a either apron or tea towel above it just in case some chopping and liquid goes on me. Um, I can chop it there, prep it and put it on the bench. And then if I'm cooking and I'm tossing a pan, I can actually sometimes bring it down, put it on my lap on the, on the, um, on the chopping board, um, given it's good with heat, I can see it really clearly and stir it and then put it back. Um, and then, um, interesting that I was chatting to Georgina about the other day is if I'm cooking like a big pot of um, pasta or something with hot water or maybe blanching something, um, there's a few different ways that I'll tackle that. So I'll have the water boiling, of course, and I'll, I'll fill, it in the, fill up the kettle, boil that, and then put that straight into the pot. I find that easier. Um, because I do a lot of exercise, I can actually grab a tea towel and pick it up with one hand and strain it. But I realize that is daunting for a lot of people. Not everyone can do that. So other things you can do is you can get like what you call a spider. So it's basically a long style sort of spoon. It's like a strainer style sort of spoon. If you look up spider, spider spoon, you should be able to find it on YouTube and you can get one of those. Um, you can individually take pasta out. I don't like doing that because I hate overcooking pasta. I think that's blasphemy as Antonio will agree with me. So it takes too much time for me. So I'll do it with, with my hand or I'll start emptying bits of water out with a ladle till it's light enough to pick up and do it that way if it's a really, really big pot. Um, so that's one of my little hacks I like to do. And then having seasoning and really everything on hand makes it very, very easy as you're cooking to not run around and burn something to keep an eye on everything. And I'll have a gigantic spice cupboard next to me, which makes it helpful. Um, so how does cooking look like for you, G? I know you've already explained a little bit, but um, 
you have anything on hand or sounds like you're quite a good helper for Andrew as well. So. Yeah, um, just a couple of things. Um, if there are a lot of veggies to chop up, you can buy different gadgets as you've probably seen on um, the mm -hmm. shopping TV. I've got one here, I don't know if you can see it. These little, little products that you can put veggies mm -hmm. in and you can slice this quite mm -hmm. fast and it just shoots out from here. Mm -hmm. All these little slice out mechanisms, you put the potato in there and you just gadgets I use for the lentil soup, which is thousand vegetables in there. Um, but also other things that I use to make life easier and because I'm concerned about the the stove um, bench top being at eye level and the flames being so close because it's a gas stove, I use electric pans or the air fryer. I use a microwave a lot. Um, there's my slow cooker, the pressure cooker. Um, that yeah, they're all electrical stuff. So and it's something that it's quite easy to use. It usually comes with recipe books. So um, they're the sort of things that I like to use. Um, like you said, Lockie, having the the hot water boiling and um, for pasta today, for example, there's no way that I could you know, strain the pasta that way. So those are the sort of things that I leave for my husband to do. Um, but yeah, safety is a big concern for me. So um, yeah, so I try to avoid anything that's dangerous, but you found your way and you found that it works for you, which is really good. Um, but yeah, so there's the, some of the things that I do in my book. Brilliant, G, I love that. And then I think this is important to point out that, you know, um, some of us like to do everything ourselves, but it's it's super helpful getting someone to to lift something. Like I made a mistake once. I was cooking in a big cast iron tray, a uh, rabbit um, sort of rabbit ragu, right? And I was cooking that, and then when I went to pick it up, I've gone, oh my gosh, it's too heavy to put in the oven. So I went over to the neighbours, knocked on their door, asked them to come over, get, give me a hand to put in the oven, and then when the guests arrived later, they took it out, and then it was fine. So sometimes you do need assistance, um, and it's always good to ask for it. What about yourself, Antonio? How does cooking look like for you? I think you have a setup. Um, my kitchen is probably very similar to yours, Lockie. It's not an accessible kitchen or anything. Um, I guess I've got fairly long arms, so I can sort of reach everything. Um, but for me, the big thing, and Georgina's showed some props. I had some similar here. I've got some different ones. For me, the food preparation, having limited hand function like fine really fine chopping sometimes when you need some fine chopping like if you, you know if stir fries and stuff that you know you sort of get away with just coarse chopping that's fine but it's the fine chopping so i have a very similar um mincer grinder to um, georgina i have a mooly grater which is the same thing it's just handheld um i will show i've got mandolin as well so the sliding thing um, you know, for me, I've got to be really careful with that because I can't quite hold with the hand function. So I'm sort of pressing against it and need to, you know, I, I have to take my time because I can't grip um, with regular hand function. So I can't go as fast as someone could. But for me, the big thing was, and once again, this sort of started at Talbot, um, you know, I, I, I buy and get, I might unblur my background because you won't be able to see these. Sorry. Uh, yeah so i buy or i had bought sort of knives that you know you can get different sets so different you know this is sort of one um needs replacing actually so it's a bit smaller but i don't have to hold it and I'm, like lucky i have the chopping board on my lap so i'm able to chop everything on my lap um, and bring everything to the stove and add it you know and they do different types so that's longer again um and a different type and then you can get the same in sort of like a bread knife as well. So they do different types. Um, I got one of these for really fine chopping. So you put everything in it and you pull the string. Um, and it, but it's good for herds and things like that. So it sort of chops it all up. You can get electric ones and all that. Um, and then I've also got, you know, a 
a box cutter. And this also acts as a grader as well. So, you know, rather than having to hold a grader, um, you know, I don't need, don't need to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, so for me, the food prep, but I also get really, um, it's sort of been a bit better in recent times with, I actually sort of, when I'm in, I start thinking about it when I'm at the shops now. So, for example, onions, I hate cutting onions, just I hate them. You can now buy frozen cut up onions that are easy to use. You know, supermarkets um, really help with a lot of the food prep stuff now. So I'm sort of thinking about it while I'm at the supermarket rather than buying, you know, whole things. Um, I'm sort of buying, and, and I might, might be lazy or whatever, but it's like, you know what, I can't be bothered sometimes just chopping up everything and all that. So if something's pre-chopped, um, and depending on your supermarkets, so they'll have some, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, you can buy fresh pre-chopped onions, you can buy frozen, depends what I feel like. I always have sort of frozen vegetables and that that are pre-ready to go. Um, meats and that, I just buy fresh or whatever. Um, there was a time that I was getting, just because of time, um, Marley Spoon. So they would deliver the groceries and all that to me. And I even do online butcher shopping now as well. Um, so, you know, buy bulk amounts. But for me, that's sort of where the cooking, but the, yeah, the cooking process is not too dissimilar. To Lockie, I can't grab to toss. Um, a pan so everything I do is sort of stovetop and I've sort of learned and for me it's individual so if I were to show how I hold you know stuff it's different so it just depends on your own function what works for you um you know but I pretty much do most things stovetop even slow cooking and all that I'll do it stovetop um and then you know I, I sort of learned over time so I, I can what I can and can't lift and I always have, you know, a plastic um, chopping board on my lap um, to make sure if it's anything hot or whatever. Um, with if I do cook a pasta or a rice, um, I, I yeah, I don't like necessarily straining. I'll just cook it all in one dish. So Lockie will think it, it's just a different way of cooking pasta, but I cook it all in one, and it's almost like a risotto sort of thing with pasta or what have you but yeah i sort of keep try and keep it all simple but for me the food preparation is important part that if i can buy something frozen or use gadgets and you know georgina mentioned gadgets i just go sometimes into like a home store a house store whatever they're called you know there's different ones i just have a look um because one thing i found is you, you can look up specific disabled gadgets but there's so many things out there designed for able-bodied people that it's just so handy to have around the kitchen that you can use as well. Um, and, and yeah, so, so that's what cooking looks like for me. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant. Antonio. Um, oh, sorry, Shanta, do you want to jump in? Oh, no. Um, so your cooking is like all of you guys, like with me, I normally have carers around when I cook. So with chopping and stuff, because I'm a seafood, my hand function is not the greatest. It's pretty shit. Um, and my lifting skills is absolutely terrible as well. Um, so I generally always have a carer with me when I'm cooking just to help with the chopping and everything like that and getting things out for me. But when it comes to the actual cooking and recipes, that's all me. Um, I always cook from side on when I'm at the stove. I never cook from face on. Um, only because I am very short, so it's very hard to see over the pan if I'm front on. But I've also got um, a wheelchair that can elevate as well. That's made it a lot easier for me to now see over the pan or over a pot so I can actually see what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, generally it's with another person. Um, sometimes I cook by myself, but it's a rare occasion brilliant so it's quite a clever approach from everyone like um you know there's a lot of uh i don't know about cooking equipment itself but there's a lot of disability equipment out there that would be usually five dollars for an able bod but five hundred dollars for someone um with a spinal injury um so 
you know, Antonio going and having a look just to the making things adapt to his situation using regular tools. And, you know, you don't necessarily need disability um, accessible equipment, if you will. Oh, sorry, Antonio, did you want to say something? I oh, forgot yeah. that I did forget the biggest thing was a good food processor um, that slices and everything's like, especially if everything is going to go into one pot and the order doesn't necessarily matter. I just, a slicing blade on a food processor, run it all the way through, and then just tip it into the pot. So it's like, yeah, that, that, that was the other thing I forgot to mention. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And there's nothing wrong with getting going and getting, and this is coming from a chef, um, getting pre-chopped things. You know, these days it's very, very convenient for people because it takes a bit more time, like finesse and everything like that. And if your hand function um, isn't quite, a, um, you know, you don't have good dexterity, those shortcuts really help. Like chopping your onion, really, you don't lose much quality if you chop it early and you wait for a while. It actually probably takes a lot of city out, to be honest with you. So. Um, you know, getting someone's, getting someone else's help, like using a carer and maybe probably Shantae is looking over them like Gordon Ramsay, making sure they're doing a good job. <laughs> um, those little hacks make all the biggest difference. You don't have to go and look at disability um, specific setups, even though they do make it a bit easier. Um, but it's not, it's not essential if you're wanting to cook and, you know, being time poor sometimes, you know, if you have a chopped onion, that saves a lot of time. It does. Like we all can't hack it up like a chef. Um, and yeah, having setups like that. All right. So we've already touched on it. Um, we're going to have a guest come in very soon. She may come in midway through this, but um, I guess we're going to talk about kitchen setups. And now um, there's a lot of um, interest out there that I've spoke to people before about disability specific setups. Um, um, just to explain myself, I have, like I mentioned earlier, just a standard place, right? Kitchen's quite high. Um, I've always cooked like that. So I've always been used to that. Um, so I literally have a pan right here. So when I'm cooking with a pan, I actually like to, the reason I take it down to look on my lap is so I can stir and make sure nothing where I can see is burning. Um, and I have everything at hand really easy. And when cleaners come, I make sure they know not to put everything away in the corner so I can't reach it. Um, but yeah, there's so many different options out there. Like I'm looking to buy a house um, soon and I'm going to make that accessible and have actuators on the bench. So what that means is the bench will go up and down. So personally, I like the idea of having a lower style setup. It's not for everyone. Someone might not like the look of it, um, but I love the idea of having a full bench space of being able to chop right here and then having um, having the stove right there, um, gas preferably for me. I like gas. Um, Induction is brilliant too. It's probably safer induction if you're um, worried about things spitting on you potentially um, or the flame. Um, and then one, one suggestion I would make to everyone is like Georgina's oven is brilliant. Um, having the oven at a good height for you because if you're trying to pick something up and put it into an oven, like my oven at the moment is below the stove and I have to open the door out. So I'm going really far back, reaching forward. It's uh, in the long-term scheme of things, it's not good for my shoulders. So I'm going to get it oven set up where I'm going to slide it across. It's better for your shoulders and slide on in. There's only a little bit of a lift. Um, so that's my ideal kitchen setup um, that I'm going to get. Um, Gee, did you want to quickly, even though you mentioned the video, do you want to run us quickly around your kitchen setup? Yeah, so just um, we could actually pick on my kitchen. It was actually um, renovated, well, my kitchen was renovated 20 years ago when I was injured. And um, so there was no funding for it, um, no NDIS back then, and I'm not TAC or work cover. And it was our cabinet uh, maker that had experience with a um, another person who was in a wheelchair. So he, um, basically knew that it was a good idea to have spaces underneath the benches, lowering some benches uh, for better access. And um, so, yeah, so with that, with the oven, yes, it is in a good position um, in terms of height, but I would have preferred maybe bench space towards the right of it. Being a right-hander, it makes sense taking things out and putting it um, to the right of the oven and also maybe no drawers underneath the oven. So I actually can 
face towards it instead of trying to grab things on the side out of the oven. Um, but nonetheless, it's still lots of great space and room because the, the glass door slides and rolls underneath. Um, other, another thing is you may recall my microwave being at a lower level. I actually find that a little bit difficult to grab things out once it's cooked because it's quite hot. Um, in hindsight, I would probably put it back up on at bench level. I find that it would be more accessible, but then you just reduce your bench space. So you're taking up bench space there. Um, a bigger pantry would be better. It's still a rollout one, but um, I'm finding it's quite small. Um, I think that's it. I'm pretty happy with everything else. Brilliant. Thanks, G. So what I might do is Kim um, Trussler, the OT at AQA, has joined us. And um, now that we've mentioned just a little bit about kitchen setups, what we're going to do is Kim's going to take you through his process of how to get it through the NDIS and mention a few things as well. If you wanted to introduce yourself, Kim, and jump on in. Thanks for coming. No worries. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name's Kim um, and I'm an occupational therapist and the Allied Health team leader at AQA. Um, so a little bit about me. So I um, have been an OT for about seven years um, and about five years of that I've spent um, working in complex home modifications. So I have a little bit of experience with kitchen modifications, um, but believe it or not, they're definitely not the most popular modifications um, compared to a lot of the other modifications. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about why that is. Um, so today, like Lockie said, so I'll be just talking about the, the processes and procedures related to kitchen mods. Um, and I will be, a lot of the information that I will be giving will, will be general information. So it's not specific to certain circumstances. Um, it's more just general information. Um, and I will be mostly referring to um, NDIS, um, but the... Um, it doesn't really change too much depending on what funding body. So whether it's TAC, WorkSafe, SWEP, whatever funding body um, people are accessing funding through, um, the processes for complex home modifications are generally the same. Um, in my experience when it comes to kitchen modifications, they are definitely one of the more complex um, mods to get funded. Um, and it's because there's quite a few factors that we have to consider. So the first being, and I like to refer to it as the domino effect. So when we, um, when we look at modifying one area of the kitchen, there's generally a bit of a flow on effect. So if we, uh, if we modify one thing, then that leads to having to modify another thing. And then that tends to flow on. So I do find that the older the house or the older the kitchen, the bigger the flow on effect is. And unfortunately, when we do have a flow on effect, it means that not every aspect of that is considered reasonable and necessary, which means that there generally is more out of pocket costs that are associated. So an example of that is, um, if we want to say, look at modifying the cabinetry, so we want to change some of the cupboards to drawers, depending on what went in first, whether it was the cabinetry or the flooring, that might mean ripping up the flooring to modify the cupboards. Um, if we're ripping up the flooring just to modify the cupboards, there might not be necessary a clinical justification to support that, which means NDIS might not actually fund putting the floor back in. So there could be out of pocket costs there. Um, same as the bench. So if we're having to remove part of the bench to modify the cupboards, but then we're putting the bench uh, back in, for instance, then there could be more out of pocket costs there. So it is just something to be mindful of when it does come down to kitchen modifications, that they're in most cases, depending on the level of modification, there is generally that flow on effect. Kim, um, can I just jump in and ask a quick question yeah. there? So say, for example, myself looking for a house, is that something that could, um, you know, OT could be involved with when you're looking for a house and, 
in explaining those sort of those situations? Would that be someone like yourself would be good at advising advise, that one? Absolutely, absolutely. Particularly when it does come to purchasing a property or even building a new house um, as somebody that already has their disability. Um, NDIS particularly, I'm not 100% sure about some of the other funding bodies, but especially NDIS, they can be a little bit sneaky when it comes to actually funding some of the modifications and they will sort of use the excuse that, well, you're already aware of your, your functional limitations. So we they want to, I guess, be reasonable with the costs that they're putting in. So if you, for example, buy a house and the kitchen is upstairs for some reason, um, NDIS would probably be quite reluctant which, with supporting modifications in that sense compared to, you know, a, a property that you purchased on one level. So that's probably a bit of a drastic example, um, but it just goes to show that we, uh, they, they will definitely fund modifications within reason, um, but we do have to be careful when it comes to purchasing properties and um, building new homes. Um, so another factor that can make uh, modifications, the kitchen modifications um, more difficult to fund um, is actually proving what is specific to your disability um, and then what is considered an everyday expense. Um, so if you are receiving NDIS funding, you're aware that NDIS don't fund um, everyday items. And a kitchen in a home is considered an everyday item. Every home has to have a kitchen. Every kitchen has to have a kitchen sink. Every kitchen has to have a bench, cupboards, a stove, oven, etc. cetera. Um, so it's highly unlikely that any funding body would approve um, every single cost to a modifier. So if we were, um, for example, gutting the whole kitchen, so we're ripping out everything and we're pretty much starting with a blank canvas. It's extremely unlikely that every single cost associated with putting the kitchen back together would be um, covered by NDIS. And that's because not every single aspect of the kitchen is related to um, somebody's disability. So, for example, um, NDIS might fund... Um, so similar to the things that Georgina was just explaining, you know, they may fund an oven that opens to the side, they may fund part of the bench being lowered, um, or potentially areas of the bench being accessible. Um, but then there's other factors like overhead cupboards that, you know, other people in the house might need. NDIS wouldn't fund that. Um, they might fund tapware and a spout that is accessible, but they might not actually fund the kitchen sink because it's considered an everyday um, an everyday cost. So, and again, this is just generally speaking, but when you're going into these processes for a kitchen mod, um, generally there is always going to be some sort of out-of-pocket costs there. And, and it does depend on the level of modification. You know, we could be speaking complex modification, um, but that could just mean we're only modifying part of the kitchen rather than actually rebuilding the whole kitchen. Um, so some ways that we can, I guess, bring down the costs is reusing appliances. Um, so we might want to modify the bench and modify the cupboards, but reuse the stove that you've already that's already in the house, reusing um, cupboard handles, reusing tapware, um, and then keeping the, the layout of the kitchen the same. So keeping the sink in the same position because the plumbing is going to stay in the same position. Um, we might change the type of oven that, um, the, you know, change it to something that's more accessible, but installing it in a similar location so that the electricity or the gas lines are in the same spot. And if we're not having to do too much reconfiguring of, um, of, of those sort of items, particularly when it comes to plumbing and electricity, that can keep the cost down, which is what NDIS wants to see. So where do we start when it comes to a kitchen, um, a kitchen modification? So before we can even sort of consider the modification itself, 
we need to make sure that it actually meets the reasonable and necessary criteria. So I'm sure a lot of you are aware NDIS have very specific reasonable and necessary criteria that clinicians need to consider when it comes to funding um, complex modifications. But generally speaking, it's the same across all different funding bodies. So they may be worded a little bit differently, but the, the information that we provide is the same. So the modification must be related to, um, uh, to an individual's disability. It must represent good value for money and be cost effective. So say reusing appliances to bring the costs down. Um, it must be related to your identified goals. So if you don't have a goal in your NDIS plan that specifies independent living and meal preparation, NDIS won't even look at the submission um, if we send it through. So sometimes the very first step before we can even look at the kitchen is um, going for a change of circumstance and actually adding that goal into your plan um, so that the goal aligns with the, the request that we're making. Um, it must not include day-to-day -day living costs. Um, it must be effective and beneficial. And most importantly, it must take into account reasonable support given by informal and formal supports. So this one is really important, particularly when it does come to kitchen modifications. So if an individual is, say, receiving funding from the NDIS for, um, for say, for a support worker to come in 20 hours a week to do meal preparation, and then we're looking at modifying the kitchen, but there's no, but we're not looking at removing the funding or reducing the funding that NDIS are already contributing, they would look at that as a duplicate of support and they wouldn't fund it. So it's not necessarily saying that you can't receive support if you're going for a kitchen modification. You definitely can receive both, but we have to be looking at, well, what, what way is a good value for money? So if we do the kitchen modification, an individual might only need 10 hours of support for meal prep a week instead of 20. So it's, we're, we're sort of able to represent that it's, a, it's cost effective. It's going to overall reduce costs to the NDIS in the long run. Um, same as informal support as well. So if a person is living with a partner or a friend and they're contributing to some of the cooking, um, we need to be, again, sort of being able to highlight when it comes to justifying the need, um, why that support can't be providing it all the time. So is that formal support? They work full time. Maybe they're moving out of the house. They've got other life commitments. So we just, I guess, need to be able to highlight that um, uh, that the support, the support isn't always going to be there, essentially. Um, and then that's showing that the modification is effective and beneficial as well. So some examples of what NDIS would likely fund. Again, this is just general information. Um, so some examples are removing cabinetry joinery um, under nominated areas in the kitchen. So removing cupboards and drawers to provide knee and foot clearance, which is um, particularly beneficial for wheelchair users. Um, so some reasonable areas would be under the sink, um, under hot plates um, and under bench areas where meal preparation will take place. Um, changing appliances to accessible appliances, so like a side opening oven. Um, changing cabinetry to facilitate accessible storage. So that could be swapping cupboards for drawers or a pull-out pantry instead of just a standard cupboard pantry. Um, adding in additional power points that are in accessible reach. Um, improving lighting in the kitchen is another one. Um, and height adjust adjustable bench tops as well. So it's not likely that NDIS would fund the whole um, bench to be height adjustable, but definitely areas that are used. So your prep area, 
your, your stove, if you've got other people living in the house, um, can all be height adjustable. Um, and a few examples of what NDIS generally wouldn't fund. Um, so they won't fund an upgrade or replacement of the entire kitchen, um, particularly if it's going to add value to the home. Um, so they just don't feel that it's a that's a, a good use of funding. Um, they don't replace hot water or gas systems. So, for example, if you were, you know, if NDIS did approve some funding to put towards a home modification, uh, a kitchen modification, but the builder said, well, you need to upgrade your hot water system as well, they wouldn't fund that. That would be a cost that you would have to absorb. Um, a lot of the time, same if you were swapping from gas to induction or induction to gas, um, that part that you know they would fund the hot plate but they wouldn't fund you know adding in a gas line or, or things like that um they also don't fund plumbing and electrical work beyond what has been approved for the modification um, and this includes upgrading the switchboard so if you're living in a really old home and the switchboard is no longer compliant um, ndis would fund the electrical work to be done but you would have to pay for the switchboard to be upgraded for, before the builders would actually be able to do the work. Um, and saying they wouldn't fund uh, upgrading or replacing kitchen fittings or fixtures um, that can otherwise be reused. So for example, if you're replacing cupboards to drawers, um, it would be NDIS's understanding that you could reuse handles for instance um, or reuse cabinetry where you can um, and then yeah same as uh, if you've already got accessible taps for instance in the kitchen um, reusing the accessible taps so whatever can be reused is reused and that will obviously bring down the cost and we do find that if we can highlight um, in our reports that we are reusing x y and z it is more likely that NDIS are going to approve A, B and C because we are showing that, well, it's cost, you know, we are being cost effective because we're trying to save money elsewhere. A um, few other little points when it comes to complex home modifications in general, particularly with NDIS, it's a long process. Um, it's always good to go into this, um, you know, when you are starting off these processes with your clinicians, um, don't go into it thinking that it's going to happen next week. No matter how hard your clinician works, no matter how quickly they get things submitted to NDIS, they're going to take a really long time to get approved. More often than not, depending on the level of modification, it can take anywhere from, from six to 12 months just to get it even looked at by the NDIS. It is improving. It is improving. We are finding that NDIS are looking at reports a lot quicker. Um, but it does take a lot of time um, and then obviously building, you know, the building industry in general are, uh, um, like most industries, um, short of workers. Um, so it can take time to get appointments um, with the right people. And we generally always want to work with the people that have a good understanding of the modifications that we're requesting. You know, we don't like to go out and just use um, Bob the builder from down the road, we want to try and work with people that have an understanding of NDIS, have an understanding of, of disability in general, um, because it does make the process easier. So that's a bit of a, a bit of a gist of um, kitchen modifications. Um, if you are interested in exploring kitchen modifications, the best person to start is with your occupational therapist, if you have one. Um, but if you do have any questions or if you would like further information about your specific circumstances, you can also reach out to me or one of the other OTs at AQA because um, we are more than happy to help. Marvellous. Thanks so much, that, Kim. That was incredible the inf information you, you've given. Um, just so everyone knows, this is being recorded and it will be sent to people and it'll be on YouTube as well. So if you want to really look at what you've just seen how much you've learned i've absorbed a lot um go back over or again yeah just give kim or an amazing ot um an ot call at aqa thanks so much there kim no worries thanks guys
All righty. So um, I don't know about you guys, but my brain's full. Um, so I might just continue the last question um, that I've that I phrased that um, Tony has already touched on it a bit in his setup. Um, but I guess if you could just elaborate a little bit, Antonio, of your kitchen setup or if you have a dream setup or. Yeah, I dream setup. Yeah. Yeah, don't know. Haven't really thought about dream setup. Um, yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I've never really thought about it because I've always sort of just used what I've used and sort of adapted around what I've had. And to me, the appliances and, you know, the, the stuff in the kitchen and sort of um, are really important. I don't really use an oven for any of my cooking, so it's not something that I've ever... Obviously, you know, something similar to Georgina, height and all that would be good. Um, I think for me, I prefer cooking on gas. I've tried um, induction cooking, and I'm not necessarily a big fan of it. So it's a preference thing, because I know you can buy just massive hot plates of, you know, they're all induction, you just put a pan on it, doesn't matter where they are. Um, and they start cooking and obviously from a safety point of view reaching over gas or you know electric hot plates is dangerous but you, so, you know once again i've sort of adapted to that and not an issue um i mean probably the biggest thing for me that i struggle with is um and it sounds silly it's more the um the sink in the kitchen if i have to reach into the sink if there's something down the bottom um and cleaning it um you know so i get i get housekeepers and cleaning but you know if, if i go to there and do that um but as for dream setups for me it's just always appliances i have an air fryer i never had an air fryer for a long time and i'm stupid i don't know why i didn't get that sooner um because that sort of you know has helped a lot um you know microwave is on a bench um, and I'm able to you know, use that safely. So uh, the biggest thing for me is sort of like, like I said, not so much the setup, but, and I work with my OT around, you know, appliances and things when I um, was in rehab and got a lot of that. Um, that. So the knives are all funded. Um, they don't, you know, they don't always fund all chopping stuff, but, you know, to, to the point that if it's just a daily thing, you know, you can buy, buy it from Kmart, Target stores, Amazon. I, I always look on Amazon now, to, um, to be honest. They seem to have a lot of different things. But, yeah, for me, the setup is I sort of work – I've always just worked around with what I've got and I never really thought about it too much. Um, you know, I try and be as, an adapt as adaptable as I can. So. Brilliant. It sounds like um, you don't you don't change your kitchen setup. You just make yourself work for any kitchen setup. That's um, very helpful. You could pick up and go anywhere you wanted to cook. Um, oh. Yeah, just on that, I think that's the biggest thing to me that I don't. And it's the same with my bathroom, which you know is accessible and all that as well. But I don't want to be locked into. I have to stay where I am. That if I do need to move or if I choose to move or whatever. And like I said, not everyone has that luxury or has that mindset that if, if I were to pick up from here and go elsewhere, mm -hmm. then I would be able to do that seamlessly. Um, where, like I said, not everyone has that ability or has that mindset. So, Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that, Antonio. Um, and Shante, how's your, how's your kitchen setup look like? Just normal, really. Um um i am moving into an apartment that um does have a few extra little bits and pieces that i guess i've never really worked with before um it's more of an accessible kitchen um the oven has like a tray underneath it's a pool um the um yeah there's just a lot of things that i personally haven't worked with i've always just used what i have and just yeah gotten on really Amazing. It sounds like you've always found a way and, you know, you've, you use carers to sort of navigate around things and, you know, it's, you could just literally pick up in any kitchen almost and work around it. Fantastic. All right. So now we're just going to move on to, um, 
just a bit of general dietary advice and just a disclaimer for everyone we are none of us are dietitians um we all have a spinal injury we know we need to eat a certain way so this is um of just general nature um this if you do need specific advice i recommend do go to a dietitian there's a lot of good ones out there um but the main reason i'm bringing this in is everyone can give you what to eat diet advice and everything but how do you put that in your cooking like eat more rice eat this and it's like if i just eat steamed rice all the time i'm going to go nuts right so potentially making fried rice dishes or things like that so for example i um my dietary requirements are quite different because I'm, I'm a hand cyclist. I train about six days a week and do a lot of Ks and um, carbohydrates are quite an important energy source for me. So I've got to find ways to get them into my, um, it, it, as much in as I can almost, um, depending on how much training I'm doing. So I will usually have rice with a lot of meals um, and I will make a fried rice. I may make a risotto and I tend to be a bit leaner than I used to be. When I was a chef, I used to add a lot of fat. Now I pull back on it um it doesn't taste as nice really but there's little tricks i could do to try and make it taste nice um but that's predominantly what i do and with stir fries and i had noodles through stir fries um i don't really have much sandwiches but i will have like lots of oats and i'll do overnight oats so i'll soak them the night before with flavorings and make it really delicious um but i tend to go to a lot of stir fries and now a lot of Japanese cooking that involves noodles and a lot of delicious seasonings to add to that. Um, what about yourself, G? Do you have any um, sort of tricks for adding dietary requirements into your cooking? Yes, I, I do. I What I like to do um, of the morning is to try and get all my three fruit, three veg into the day. I put it all in my smoothie. So, for example, I would have carrots, cucumbers, uh, spinach, banana, frozen uh, strawberries and blueberries, and put a bit of coconut water in there and chia seeds. So that's my morning breakfast, and I'm happy that I've got my fruit and veg in for the day and can be happy with what I eat for lunch and dinner, knowing that I've already had the good stuff in the morning. That's not to say that I'm going to have junk food every day for lunch and dinner, but um, that's I feel good when I do that, and it's helpful with the chia seeds as well. Um, they help the digestive system, as you probably are aware, and um, also very very mindful of increasing the fiber content um, because you know we all need that extra help. And yeah, so that's how um, I'm not actually cooking there, as you can see lazy put it into the neutral bullet but um yeah it's still it's still healthy and yeah that's what i do but i think that's the that's the trick isn't it g that um if you can take little shortcuts here and there it makes it easy like chopped onions like antonio uses um you know blend up things in a smoothie especially in the morning if you're short in time great way to get your nutrition in and out the door um i do that a fair bit with my training as well um and what about yourself Antonio if, if you have any dietary requirements or what you how you tend to look I'm probably not going to give dietary advice because <laughs> I just won't uh, I don't eat breakfast I have coffee for breakfast I think breakfast is overrated um but I, I try and eat fairly well um uh, I don't necessarily eat a lot of fried foods um I eat a lot of fish um, chicken, like I said before, I'm probably a really simple eater. I don't, you know, unless I, you know, my indulgences are, it's probably a good thing that I don't like or can't bake because my indulgences are sweet foods and cakes and listening to stories of cheesecakes before gave me ideas. Um, Uber Eats in my area does have a cheesecake shop that delivers and Daniel's Donuts, which is not good. Um, uh, but I guess just general eating for me, I don't necessarily eat a lot um like I, said, I don't eat breakfast lunch is you know so dinner for me is always sort of the big thing um you know and i am mindful of sort of eating fiber liquids um and all that but you know i do have my indulgences so like i said before i like french cooking so i i there are times that i'll sort of sit there more probably more so in winter rather than summer because in summer it's a lot fresher but um 
you know, the the creams and the butters, and I wouldn't eat that every day though, because it's just too much. Um, I do try and cut down on, and this is just my, the way my body works. I'll try and have brown rice instead of white rice, you know, um, carbs really bloat me, even though I sort of, you know, think they're important. I do buy um, now, if I, you know, I, I just have them in the um, cupboard, you know, so I'll, I switch from sort of regular noodles to rice noodles, gluten-free, not because I'm a celiac, just because I think it helps with bloating. Once again, that's just me. Um, it did different things for different people. The thing with gluten-free foods is they're not always as nutritious. So if you need to take something else, but you know, work that out for yourself. Um, gluten, bar Barilla gluten-free pasta is as good as regular pasta. You can't even um, notice it. Um, and that's an Italian saying that. Um, so yeah, like I said, I do have my indulgences, but I probably, and, and to be honest as well, like from a diet point of view, um, I fast. So that, yeah, so for me not eating breakfast, so I do fast and I find that that works. I did try, I know a lot of people try keto, but one thing, and I, I have spoken to nutritionists about this in the past. One thing that I find depending on, um, your bladder management with people with spinal cord injuries, it's not always advisable. I'm not a doctor, but talk to someone to do keto because it changes, um, it adds ketones to your urine, which can cause more frequent bladder infections. And I found that, that I tried keto, but that, you know, and once again, it could have just been me but, and my bladder infections because it changes the proteins in your urine sort of thing. Um, so yeah, but that's sort of me eating in a nutshell and, I, and as georgina drinks water i don't drink enough water i drink coffee most of the day so <laughs> could it be more italian <laughs> i uh, i can't believe that i just said that there's a good um variety of uh gluten-free pasta that's interesting so i'll have to go and try it absolutely um yeah so um shante so how do you um wow. like you i think you mentioned it before that you have um, intolerances and how do you introduce that into your food or avoid certain ingredients? I'm like fructose and lactose intolerant <laughs> have been since I was really young. Um, so I just really have to be careful with what I eat and what I don't eat because if I eat a lot of onions and garlic the next day, my stomach is bloated, I feel sick, I want to vomit. So I always just really try to eat plain meals. That's why I kind of guess I like cooking for other people. I'm like, oh, you can have this. And I'm like, yeah, but I can't. <laughs> um, so I guess that's why I enjoy cooking because other people can enjoy it. Um, so realistically, I am a terrible eater. I barely eat maybe once or twice a day. I do drink, though, two litres of water a day, though. I have to, like, I always make sure I um, get to my two litre mark of just water any other fluid is just whatever so i try and drink over two liters a day um but yeah that's really about it brilliant well look thanks for so much for sharing that everyone um now what i want to do is put it back to actually just we'll finish on one last question um and then we'll go into a bit of q a for any of the guests that they want to ask um and if someone really wants to jump on, we can get someone on to maybe if they want to add something more. Um, but I think what I'll leave with now is um, if everyone, it's a very, very hard thing to pick, but if everyone could mention maybe their favorite thing to cook, because favorite dish is very, very hard. I struggle for sure. Um, if I was to say myself, um, it's a dish I cook on Monday into a regular I freeze a batch of it. It's called red beans and rice. Um, if you ever ever on my social media, you always see it. Um, and I have that because it's a very comforting dish, especially on a cold Monday night. I love it. And I love cooking any slow cooked dishes because the result is just next level. Um, melts in your mouth. Um, but yeah, that's my favorite stuff I like to cook. Um, how about you, G? Is there something particular you like to cook? Uh, it's just a plain, boring bolognese sauce, but um, I just know that you do have to cook it for a long time for it to taste, you know, that much better. Um, and also, just curious, Antonio and you, Lockie, if you make bolognese, do you add a secret ingredient 
that's not your typical standard bolognese recipe. I is might jump, jump in on that, and then Antonio's itching to go on, surely. Um, I very rarely do a bolognese, but if we're going from a ragu here, I like adding pork and fennel sausages. I think it just adds so much flavour to it. Uh, <laughs> I go for it, Antonio. I can see you disgust there. I, I don't like fennel seeds, so I don't, I don't know that's or anything. Pork, no, two meats. The trick is two meats. Um, cook it long, cook it slow. Um, it depends what you like. There's no recipe. No, no. Depends what you like. It's... Some people put nutmeg. Um, yep. My grandmother puts sugar um, to help offset um, the taste of the tomatoes. So it's what you got. My thing is you got to cook to what you eat. I don't cook food, you know. Um, yeah, so you got to cook to what you like. A signature dish, but yeah, two meats always important. So, so beef. The beef. So the beef and the pork. Yeah, beef. so it can be beef, pork, or. Yep anything fatty even beef and lamb so lamb's a bit fattier and don't buy lean cuts of meat like that's right you know, because i know you know weight conscious or whatever but don't buy lean cuts of meat because you need the fat to um so we add a little bit of curry as curry powder and also parsley chopped parsley as well and the usual you know the carrot onion garlic try yeah. try a pinch of cinnamon if you, if you like oh. Yeah, if you have curry powder um, and no garlic in carbonara, Lockie. Um, um, uh, a signature or a dish that I enjoy cooking, I mentioned before, a dish with chicken and apple cider and cream. Um, I like making, um, once again, French cooking. I don't do it all the time. Beef bourguignon, so it's basically beef cooked in red wine um, for six or seven hours. I just let it put it on the stove and away you go um i did i did mention before sorry my other way of eating and i could eat this every day i don't use my oven but i use my barbecue a lot so i actually i have a weber q which i find if i'm going to roast meat i roast it on the barbecue um i could eat barbecue every day so that's me yeah, yeah, beef bourguignon is one of my favourites, and I use a whole bottle of red wine, and I tell you, the result you get is incredible. And uh, and, and some sherry. Sherry? Okay, I'll take note of that. I do love sherry and cooking. It's amazing. It's got a certain sweetness about it. Um, so, Shante, you mentioned you look, you look a lot of curries. Is that something particular, or is there something else? Um, generally, if I, like, can't be bothered cooking but really want to cook, I'll just make Moroccan chicken. Um it's the easiest takes like five minutes realistically um so yeah it's probably one of my favorite and quickest things to make yeah beautiful do you have like a little spice mix you add to it or you just buy it buy a moroccan seasoning or yeah buy the moroccan seasoning my dad um taught me the recipe when I was younger, so i just like stole it from him yeah nice no, always steal it from the dad who's a chef that's that's a good is idea it a, is it a family secret or is it able to be made public <laughs> It's not really that much. It's just chicken, Moroccan spice, a bit of flour, oil, and pan. And you just fry it off? Pretty much. Yeah, del delicious. All right, so going to put it back to um, back to the guests. Um, does anyone want to start firing some questions, a bit of a Q&A, and then we can um, – we're happy to answer, answer some questions. Uh, gee, do you want to help me out with this? Is they can everyone just write down a question, or do we have to? There's only been a couple of questions um, just okay. throughout today. There was yep. someone trying to be cheeky about does Northern Italy make better pasta sauce than the South? That that's an Antonio question, I think. Yeah, no, I've I've addressed that, and I know. The, I did. Uh, the anonymous person who's no longer attending, um, I, I addressed their cowardness. <laughs> yes. Ah, oh, you guys not, already answered it. He's no longer on the list. Yeah. So. Um, if anyone wants to put their hand up in um, uh, any of the attendees wants to put their hand up um, to join, to say something, um, feel free to do so and um, you can add something or ask us directly. Or if anybody has 
a tip or a trick or a, a very quick yeah. recipe to share with the group. Mm -hmm. And just to mention at the end there, um, we'll um, after this video is posted, we'll um, share some photos. I mean, I can share mine now of um, what I cooked when I cooked that stir fry and how it turned out. And then um, I'll get up there, Georgina, what she cooked when she cooked with Andrew, teamed up. Um, so I can just quickly share that now. Oh, here we go. Sorry, before I go, there's a question. A dish drawer or dishwasher is easier to use than a standard opening. Um, I don't have a dish drawer or dishwasher, but I do have a dishwasher that opens all the way out and it is a pain. I'm just used to doing it, but it's real pain of going there and reaching down. I think that would be very helpful. Um, anyone else use that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it is. I, I think, yeah, I, I think it is easier, but it's still, the bottom draw is still difficult, sort of having to lean forward um, and trying to put things in. So I think, I, I think it's just an individual thing of what your function is and all that. I, I think, yeah, because you can't really elevate what sort of dishwash. So like, you know, like my washer and dryer are a lot higher, but they don't sort of do that. So I think, yeah, they're always just cumbersome um, in general. I don't think there's necessarily an easy solution for that. Yeah, awesome. What about you, G? I've actually had both. I originally had the two drawer um, dishwasher. And so it's obviously a lot easier to stack the top drawer. And maybe yep. another family member can stack the bottom drawer and empty it out. Mm. But now I've got the, the big pull down one, mm. but there's drawers inside still. There's two drawers that pull mm. out, which is really good. So um, it all depends on the positioning. If you're able to have it on, on your side and easy access for yep. you and you're not leaning forward. So it all depends on the position of the dishwasher in your kitchen as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, G. And I've got um, got Natalie Patel has answered as well. So side by side single dishwasher drawers are an option to keep both drawers accessible at top drawer height. Thanks so much for doing that. Um, and Karen James, Fisher, and Pykel, they're a great brand in general. Um, have a good two drawer dishwasher. So that's yeah, that's that sounds very very helpful. Um. Yeah, if anyone else wants to shoot more questions, otherwise I'm just going to show a photo of what I ended up cooking with our stir fry. I'll quickly whip that up now. There's no sound needed. So that is, we'll post it up there, but that's what I ended up cooking there. If everyone can, everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah. So that was just again to chicken. Um, I like to eat lots of broccoli. Um, I actually really enjoy it. Just some capsicum. Um, the the, the trick with um. A lot of stir fries is don't add too much veg. You want to have a good ratio of, of meat, veg, and sauce. And the seasoning that I, um, it's really important with a lot of um, Southeast Asian cooking in particular is you want to make sure it's sweet. You want to make sure it's salty, sour, bitter, and then umami. So sweet could be literally a pinch of sugar or honey. Um, when you add honey, you got to be conscious of the time of cooking. I'll explain that in a moment because it could burn. Um, salty, so soy sauce is probably one of the biggest, if not fish sauce or even just salt. Be surprised, for example, like something like fried rice, a lot of people put soy sauce on there. I don't, depending which uh, fried rice recipe it is, um, soy sauce, I don't recommend. It just makes it too saucy and glug in. It becomes, um, yeah, it's mushy. Um, and then, so sour could be um, anything from like lemon juice, lime, depending where you where you are. Could even be things like vinegar and certain different vinegars make a huge different flavor and taste. That will suck air mirin, which is a lot of Japanese cooking, which is a rice wine. Um, umami tends to come from the meat. Um, if you add tomatoes in a lot of cooking, it can, depending on what the recipe is. Um, and... A lot of those things, if you find them in the sauce or throughout the whole dish, that will make a big difference. I like to always add a bit of spice as well. So I'll add a bit of chili sauce to things because I really enjoy spicy foods. So that sort of explains that dish there. So chicken, broccoli, capsicum, um, spring onions, and then just the sauce with, I add a bit of sugar. I use um, fermented um, fermented Chinese chili bean paste, Dopanjong it's called, a um, bit of hoisin sauce. Um, 
and a touch of rice vinegar, and then that was it. And um, it was delicious, I thought. All right. So, is there any more questions? We got a chat here, and also Antonio. Um, Antonio shared on there if anyone wants to click on it. Um, that spider I talked about earlier. So the little strainer spoon, if you will, um, which is very very useful for not just for straining um, pasta, but you can like I like to make a lot of flavored oils. Um, so I'll cook cook garlic in oil and I'll strain that out there so that when I cook something the garlic doesn't burn. Um, all right, so you can you just on that you can buy and I have tried and I just could use it because more of a height thing, but yeah, um, you can buy the pots that have the inbuilt strainers and you lift everything out. Uh, I find just my function that I couldn't use it. Um, so I just gave it away. Um, but that may be beneficial. Like if you that'd be probably beneficial if you've got a lower stove. Um, so, you know, if you're a wheelchair user, like if you're able to than that, it's fine. But I found lifting it, I had to reach too high up to, to actually take it out. Um, but you can buy them, so the, the pots with the strainers in them, you know, and they use them in kitchens and what have you as well. Um, I find a little cheap. I, I got, a, I guess, similar to a spider, but I'll cook rice or something in the strainer and take just lift the strainer out and i'm done but only for small quantities so and microwave rice easy <laughs> yeah that's a good little hack as well like using microwave or using little things um they can make a bit of a difference and it's important to notice that when your shoulders um being in a chair especially if you have no abdominal muscles um shoulders are quite in a vulnerable position um position lifting higher then your shoulder height. So if you're starting to lift things, add a bit of a weight, it adds instability and you can cause shoulder issues unless you do a lot of training to do so. Um, so I personally like to do a lot of steaming, um, boiling, I only boil pastas. Um, I use a rice cooker. I just, I look, I use a lot of rice, so I use a rice cooker. It's super easy. Um, and yeah, and steam, because I actually think, I'm very biased to say this, but I think steaming is a really light, nice way of cooking, not just to be healthy, but I think the results you get from steaming chicken, turkey, and a lot of things, even fish, I love the result, the texture. Like, I'm not going for a fry pan fried dish here. I'm going for something because I like it. Like, I'll marinate um, some fish with some maybe a little bit of soy sauce, sesame oil, or just with ginger, even by itself with a bit of salt, and I'll steam it. Um, and I love that with a bit of fried rice or whatever I have it with it adds a light dimension to it so steaming is also not just from a health point of view from an easy point of view it makes a big difference i will just mention i don't think i don't know if anyone else uses i have started experimenting more with slow cooker i never thought mm. i um i've had some epic failures with it because with the seasoning and the amount of liquid so i didn't go back but i sort of just started trial in again um like not necessarily from an accessibility point of view but you know so you know i work and all that so it's like if i can get something going and then it's done and yeah that's difficult cooking for one but like for meal preparation like if i'm creating a bulk amount then um then yeah sort of recommend that i don't know if anyone else yeah. uses one of those but i i personally tried once a long long time ago um and i probably didn't use that use it correctly it was just a cheap one and i stuffed it up and then i used my ceramic coated cast iron um which is heavy mind you um but yeah i haven't quite got it but i've heard a lot of people um did, did georgina did you mention use a pressure cooker yeah it's a um it's a pressure cooker combined with a slow mm. cooker and I've used it to make minestrone soup. It's really nice uh, for winter coming up. Um, but yeah, there's, it usually comes with a, with a great recipe book. And if you follow the recipe and you press the right buttons um, and the timings, you get it all right. Otherwise, you can mm -hmm. stop, it, stop it up. Mm -hmm. um, it is there and I should use it more. But um, I need to put it in a more mm -hmm. accessible place. Because if you hide it away in the cupboard, you don't end up using mm. it. So um, 
Yeah, I need to get it out more. And the air fryer, we've got it out in the back near the barbecue. I need to put it in front of me and use it more because it's so easy to use and very quick. Easy yeah. to clean, easy to clean as well. That's, that's part of it, isn't there? So a lot of people don't like to cook just because it's harder to clean. Um, but yeah, again, highlighting that, you know, there's a lot of gadgets and stuff out there. You don't need to go get accessible, um, well, accessible defined by what a lot of companies sell um, to pay extra to get it. You can just get these products that everybody, it's, it's the same for everyone and it makes such a big difference. Um, Shantae, do you ever use a slow cooker for the curries or anything or do you prefer to put it on a pot? I prefer to manually. I like to just yeah. sit and watch it and <laughs> enjoy it. You can just like yeah it's fun just watching it cook and seeing the changes it makes through the hours mm -hmm. and have a glass of wine as you're watching it oh that's essential <laughs> yeah. that's that slow cooker is eight hours worth of wine though just so. yeah. <laughs> but i think my, my golden rule is if i cook with wine i have to drink it like it's it's rude um if you don't so um i cook with wine a bit by the way no i'm kidding <laughs> All right, so I'm conscious of time. We're just over 2.30. Um, is there any, if there's any questions that anyone wants to ask, please um, ask now or um, definitely get in touch with AQA. We've only just sort of touched on, um, you know, we could have, all of us between us could have spent another four hours talking about cooking whilst cooking. Um, but we just try to make it as um, easy, easily accessible for everyone as we could, um, just sort of explaining how we do it. Um, if we started talking about recipes and arguing about it, it could go on for a long time. So um, we'll, I'll get everyone to finish on just a bit of a, a keynote, I guess. Um, I think for me, um, cooking is, is something I absolutely love. It's a passion. Um, I actually learned it after I had my spinal injury. Um, and funny enough, it helps with my strength. Um, at the beginning, I couldn't pick up a lot of pots the injury because it was hard and I used it. I'm very stubborn though. Um, and I did that and actually helped with a lot of, um, it helped strengthen me to get around in my chair and do transfers and certain things just because I was cooking. And at the beginning it was exhausting for my shoulders, but strength built over time. I had no shoulder problems luckily and it helped me a lot. So I've, it's just become something really important for me that kept, keeps me strong that even if I stopped training, it helped me with. Um, Georgina is a, Anything you want to add at the end, cooking helps you or you enjoy about or eating or? Well, just talking to you guys has inspired me to probably cook a little bit more. <laughs> I feel bad, but no, I shouldn't say that. I, I, um, I do help out in the kitchen. Like I said, I help with a lot of the preparation and basically Andrew does the final execution and just puts it all in the pan and it, voila. So, I mean, I've probably done... Um, if, you know, I'm happy with helping out in the kitchen, but yeah, I think I might want to do some baking. Um, it's like Shantae, try do something from scratch. Make <laughs> sure you bring him in. Yeah. Bring him into work. <laughs> bring him into work to try for sure. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, okay. Now I have to cook. All right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. What about yourself, Fenton? Is there anything you want to add in particular? <laughs> when you no, I just. A lot? No, yeah, I was going to say, just from a practical point of view, um, you know, if you like me and you need specific knives, try some. I um, mean, most OTs will have a fair knowledge um, of it as well. Um, you know, and they're, they're available to get ordered, but, you know, just go into the shops and have a gadget. I think, I think as well, um, you know, so obviously, I obviously enjoy cooking, you know, you know, there are people that, like, they enjoy cooking. I mean, don't... If you, if you don't enjoy cooking, don't force yourself to do it as well. You'll, you'll, you'll just see it as a chore um, and it should be enjoyable. Um, you know, so that, that's sort of my thing when it comes to, like I've got friends of mine that hate cooking. You know, it becomes a chore for them but, and then you'll never enjoy it. So, but from a practical point of view, just trial and error of what works as well. So, Yeah, awesome. I'm definitely trial and error kind of guy as well and YouTube has been my best friend for many years. And it's funny you say Gordon Ramsay because that's where I watch most of his videos as well. Um, there's heaps of little hip, tips and tricks out there as well. So, um, Shantae, is there anything final you feel like adding? You've covered a bit of ground as well. Well, I 
guess like with me, I, you know, I have carers that help me cook and stuff. So it's a little, you know, a little bit easier. I also make sure I do direct them, you know, with the things I want because it is my meal in the end. Um, when it comes to cooking, it's not as much exercise. Baking, though, when it comes to baking, that's a lot more to do with fitness, I reckon. Um, there's a lot more measuring. There's a lot more sifting. There's just a lot more involved where it's more exercise based, I reckon. So yeah yep yeah amazing all right well i think we'll finish up here everyone i just want to um a massive thank you to the panelists for coming down taking time out of the day um it's it's really beneficial for everyone and it's fantastic you all being here and um thanks for everyone who joined throughout the um webinar really enjoyed talking to you guys about this again we could talk for hours about it but we want to keep it a bit shorter um and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lucky. See you, everyone. Great.